Well, you know, the whole beat thing is kind of odd because, um, like I said earlier today, the, the word that I prefer that contains beat is beatific because it's a very positive word. Uh, the most common word about beat is that one is not in the best of shape, that one is poor and one has, is rebellious and, you know, has all these kind of uh, semi-negative but very positive feeling things about the world around us. And, uh, at one time, long before the Beat Movement, I was living on the streets in New York City in an old Willie's car. Uh, so I, I'm, I was Beat before the Beat. <laughs> and uh, the question about my relationships with a lot of those people and the people in this exhibition, uh, most of whom I knew either well or, or as acquaintances, uh, and some of them uh, I still know. Uh, the whole question of why there was a movement uh, still is questionable to me. Uh, and yet, I realize that I've been, you know, I've been part of the hippie mu movement. The whole beatnik thing, Nick, beatnik was con started by a, a columnist in San Francisco called Herb Kane. Kane was not his original name, his name was Cohn. Uh, he grew up in Sacramento, but he called everybody Nick. And it, it, uh, I, I saw in uh, part of the literature with this exhibition that they think Nick was Russian. I, I, I think it was not Russian, but I think it was uh, Yiddish. <laughs> and uh, Herb called everybody Nick. I was Gerd Nick, Alan was Gins Nick, uh, and of course, the beats were beatnik. Uh, so th that's what that came from. And uh, uh, it's, it's relishable. Uh, what else? Uh, the question that poetry came out of these people. Now, for instance, Alan and I, like my introductory remarks said, met in a mental institution. I was there first. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I got sent there because I had been living on the street and I was malnourished. And the, the psychiatrist said, at least you'll gain some weight. <laughs> and he was right. Uh, and Carl Solomon was the second guy who came, and he had just gotten off a boat from uh, France that he had been working on, and he brought a whole bunch of fantastic books, including many that I had never seen by John Genet, whose work I was completely unfamiliar with, Christopher Smart, who, of course, goes way back and does beautiful poetry, but uh, very odd uh, for his own time. And uh, a couple of weeks later, Alan came. And Alan came because he had stolen something at Columbia University. And um, his uh, teachers, Mark Van Doren and Lionel Trilling had decided he would be better off in the psychiatric institute <laughs> than in jail because he was in danger of going to jail. Uh, whatever. Uh, the, Alan had a, f had a few problems. Uh, there was a, guy, a friend of his 
got murdered in uh, Riverside Park, and anyway. Uh, but Alan and I uh, knew each other for more or less for the rest of his life. But we didn't always agree about things, especially this, this, somebody made this hat for me, which is called the lost letter because Alan said for 55 years that I had destroyed 18 pages of a letter that Neil Cassidy had written to Jack Kerouac. Um, 55 years later, the letter was found. <laughs> and I was vindicated. Of course, I never thought I destroyed the letter. I, I, I wouldn't have destroyed anything anybody had written, you know. Uh, Maybe, maybe love letters, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it, not even those. Uh, I have quite a few of those. Uh, hey, 12 of them from Maya Angelou, who I lived with for a few years. Uh, and, uh, you know, the question about Alan, his best po poem that I'm considered, his Kaddish, which he wrote for his mother. I never knew his mother, but I didn't know his father, who was a classical poet, nothing like Alan, and uh, who taught poetry. And he, he was, seemed like a nice guy. And Alan was a pretty nice guy when he was nice. But uh, <laughs> he was a liar, you know, and uh, he's not the only liar one has known in one's life, but uh, it was too bad, because, <laughs> uh, he he knew that he had given that uh, 18 pages to a publisher who was a friend of mine as well as his, and it was found eventually in the partner of the publisher's effects by, by his daughter, who I still know. I, I only met her because the letter was found. And, uh, you know, does anybody have any questions about, about the beat scene? Because I, I, I don't know what of the multi-possibilities I I, would be better to say. Hello. Uh, uh, were you around Ginsburg around the time that he had his vision of Blake? That he had his? He had a vision of William Blake. Oh. Uh, Alan had a lot of visions, yes, uh, and, uh, and uh, yes, and we all had visions of Blake. I mean, well, William Blake is the source of a lot of people's fondness and ability to write poetry because the, the way Blake wrote was something that one could imitate easily, number one. And number two, it contained a lot of spiritual and mystical language, uh, although it may not have been his primary intent, but uh, his primary intent was probably romantic. Um, but uh, uh, that's a good question to ask because uh, Alan certainly was into, he, he, Alan read a lot in poetry and he, he, he was good about what he knew. Um, that, that wasn't his problem. <laughs> his, his main problem was that he thought that all men should either try or be homosexual. And uh, that was uh, terribly difficult for me because uh, I had no such feelings, you know. And uh, I didn't have the kind of prejudice that some people do. But, uh, and he, he pushed it very hard uh, in, a, in a not very nice fashion. So that, that, that was a, a major situation. And he was very much in love with Carl Solomon. And that didn't work out too well because Carl had no idea of being gay, you know. And uh, uh, of course, Alan had lots of what he considered decent relationships. 
and I knew quite a few of them. And uh, uh, Peter Orlovsky was the main one, and he was a very nice guy. I enjoyed knowing them. But um, so that's like anybody else about beat. Haha, <laughs> nobody wants to go. Yes. What do you see the relationship between beat poetry and music? Ah, ha, ha, ha. Well, that's a poignant question. The, the music that we all were mostly into except for folk music, which definitely was a passion, uh, was jazz. Uh, and uh, like I said, when I got the seat, the tunes that they just played at the beginning are tunes that are, I'm very familiar with. I started out in jazz with Dixieland because, you know, I was of the age. Uh, I was a tremendous fan of bebop. Uh, I knew most of the famous musicians at the time because I was around. And uh, I kept on into it. And uh, uh, in addition to that, I've been intimately involved w with composition by a number of uh, men and women composers. Uh, at the beginning of uh, a woman named Marga Richter, we wrote a cantata together that was uh, performed by the New York Philharmonic. Uh, I spent three or four years and I knew him for the rest of his life with Harry Parch, helping him build his very unusual instruments, uh, getting together his instrumentalists for, for 12 people in, in his orchestra, uh, producing three of his recordings, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, more recently, uh, with uh, a, a good friend of mine named Ed Rosenfeld and a composer in Los Angeles named Anne L Lepore, uh, we have done an opera which is called Huxley's Last Trip. Uh, as some, it used to be LSD, the opera. Uh, but. Uh, as some of you may know, Aldous Huxley died specifically having his wife dose him with LSD as he was dying. And it was totally synchronistic at the same time that JFK was dying. Uh, so our opera has the two of them dying simultaneously. And we also have uh, JFK doing LSD in the White House with his mistress, <laughs> with, with, with Mary Mayo, which is totally documented. Uh, in fact, all of the things in the opera, uh, the discovery of LSD by Albert Hoffman uh, when he worked for Sandoz. Well, Sandoz is still making LSD. That's one LSD I've never had. I wish I had, but uh, <laughs> not, 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 I, I, it is, I'm afraid it is too late at 91. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure, uh, you know. But uh, anyway, it, the opera is very interesting, uh, and we're hoping to get it produced somewhere. Not too, uh, not too late. I mean, God knows how long I'll be around, maybe. I mean, maybe he knows, or he, she. Uh, uh, hopefully, it's a she, not a he. Uh, but, uh, or an it. Uh, anyway, the, the, why do I go on like that? Because that's my the way I do it. Anybody else? Yes. So what's the social dynamic between B and just normal mainstream society? Was there any been? 
overlap? Well, uh, there was a, uh, you know, the beat poets and the more classical poets who are a much larger group than the beat poets uh, didn't necessarily get along with each other um, because it's a whole different trip. Uh, and uh, uh, the beat movement also had a lot to do with drugs. Uh, and uh, marijuana mostly, or hashish, uh, acid, and, and usually not hard drugs. Although we always had problems with people who did do hard drugs and became junkies, and some of them died, and then others of them were, were very sick. And it, it's still a problem, uh, and the opioids are another problem uh, that we're facing. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the question of were the beats a separate culture? Not necessarily, but uh, for some people they were because uh, uh, people didn't necessarily like rebellious uh, members of the society. And uh, the difference between the East Coast and the West Coast w w were significant. Uh, but people went back and forth a lot, including me. Um, and uh, because it seemed like the, the centers of the movements were New York and San Francisco. There were pockets in other cities, but not that much. It was an, that's an interesting question. I've never really thought about that a lot. Anybody else? Yes. Excuse me? The visual arts? Well, uh, what? You know, the uh, for myself, I started writing poetry was when I was in my teens, but I didn't start doing my artwork either, collages or video or uh, kinetic works until I was in my 30s. And uh, my visual work became very much a part of the movement, which was then considered beat. Uh, and so I was exhibited a lot in exhibitions, which included the beat poets and beat artists. And there were quite a few women and men who felt that they belonged to that movement. Uh, and a lot of it was abstract. Uh, uh, some of it was surrealistic. Uh, and all of it was out of the normal mode because uh, you, you, you didn't want to be beat and be classic. You know, you wanted to be beat and be different uh, was somehow the tenor of of the movement. But the movements are, are odd. Uh, you know, I, I was a beat. I was a hippie. I was a, uh, a psychedelic artist for a long time, uh, and some of the those names and the names of movements. Uh, are meant to be denigrative of, to people who practice them, and some of them are meant to be, hey, yeah, he's, he's like that, you know, positive. Uh, but the, ne the negative uh, sometimes even outweighs the positive, because uh, uh, names can be 
something to challenge people with. And beat has been used to challenge a lot of people, including Jack and Neil and Alan uh, and Michael McClure and Philip Lamantia and uh, Robert Duncan. Yeah, I mean, some of the people like uh, are in this exhibition, like Jess. Jess was a great collagist, and he has a beautiful piece in this show. Uh, and he and Robert Duncan were a pair of gay uh, lovers for many, many years, a wonderful, stable relationship. Uh, and he was considered B, and because of him, Duncan was kind of also allied with the beats, although he was by no means a beat poet. A very good poet, classical poet uh, that he was in San Francisco Bay Area. And he grew up in California. Uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question. <laughs> but uh, uh, anything else? Uh, we have one. one, more. one. Okay, we'll slide one more in really quick. Okay. <laughs> I'm wondering like, what your favorite poetic event or poetry reading has been, or just like any memorable one that you participated Who or what? You mean who, the, who it was? Um, I guess I just mean like in general, like what is, has been your favorite poetry event? Uh, my favorite poem, for instance, and one of my favorite po poets of all time was Wallace Stevens, and the poem is The Idea of Order at Key West. I think it's one of the principal great poems of the 20th century. I started out, I mean, I, kn I knew and I helped carrying him home from the White Horse Bar because he was such a drug, drunkard. I knew Dylan Thomas, uh, and I had great respect for him and his reading. He read so beautifully, and it fit with what he wrote. You know, some p poets don't do very well in reading their own poetry, uh, and it has so much to do with sound. Uh, and uh, for me, reading is the, the most important act in poetry rather than looking at it on, in print. But uh, you don't get to do that. I'm, I'm going to read tonight, you know, but I only read maybe five or tw ten times a year. Uh, and most poets don't read at all. And some poets can't read their own poetry. Uh, it can be difficult. But, you know, like Thomas, Wallace Stevens, Theodore Rethke, uh -huh, William Carlos Williams, uh, they were all great readers. And I, I, I knew all of them, <laughs> fortunately. It's, it w w I think it's very important when you're a poet to know other poets and to have mutual respect uh, because that's difficult. It's much more difficult than the art world. The egos, I, I find the art world easier to uh, deal with actually than the poetry world uh, because uh, I must tell you that even in the beat world, I'm hardly ever mentioned in any of the beat uh, volumes, you know. Uh, why is that? I don't really know and I really don't care. Part of it is because of Alan's prejudice. Because Alan always dismissed me as a poet, uh, which was kind of amusing. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, 
his father knew my poetry and he didn't feel that way about it. <laughs> but he, he didn't agree with his father very often. He, he loved his mother and, uh, and that came, became very apartment apparent in the poem Kaddish, which, like I said, is my very favorite of his poetry. And I, I have reasons because uh, I am, and I have been quite Jewish, and the, the, the prayer for the dead, which is Kaddish, is a very important thing for Jews to relate to when their parents die. And you know, I said it for both of mine. Thanks for asking. It's always a choice. Um, I think I'm going to start reading from a book which was published in 1965, which is called After Image. But there's one thing that I always do when I read poetry, and I, I say a mantra which I wrote when more or less in the 60s during the USCO period. And it goes, take the no out of now, then take the ow out of now, then take the then out of now. And the short form is no, ow, now. It's, f it's such a fantastic w word, N-O-W, you know. Uh, uh, now is a fantastic word. Wow is a fantastic word. But no, how now, take the negative, take the pain, and take the past and the future. English seems to be the only language where then is both the past and the future, right? Pretty wild. Um, this, like I say, this is a 1965 poem book, and I'm going to read out of that, and I'm going to read out of When Then, which is my fourth book of poetry about a year ago. But um, I put, I've always written poems about mirrors. Uh, this one is called Enjoy Gravity. Enjoy Gravity. Swing wild, moving with air as you are. Swinging free, the child within breaks the ground, leaping away. Move the world with pushing air, swinging the wind. Enjoy gravity. The wind flies. Where, when it moves, does the air stop swinging? Held from above with each swing, the earth's pull brings us down. Sparrows and apples fall swinging. The harvest's weight takes us down. Our moon turns the sea. One swinging star is light for the world. Come down where you are. The sky is swinging. Your body in time with love. Swing wild moving with air as you are. Enjoy gravity. And then, uh, uh, you can wait till I'm finished. <laughs> now, driving is important. A way to get there. Nails through the Savior, one into another. If now is true, was something else. What will be? Touching is important through the always space between hands, words, circles, you, me, they. If now is true, was something else, what will be? 
believing is important, only made like tree, flood miracle with fish, two by two to bombs, if now is true, was something else, what will be? Nothing is important when you know the sound of one hand clapping is nothing. Yeah. Uh, and one more out of this book. Necessity is a mother. <laughs> I'm going to tell you I want you to be love according to Augustine. That's true. We sat too close not to touch. I tried to fly. Your brush got stuck. The bell was going to ring. I'd had enough. Break your neck under the ice. My boot made a hole. Kissed old luck. I want you to be about the subway, Priscilla. We didn't do it together. I'm going to remind you. There about here. Now about then because that's who I am. And uh, from the more recent book, uh, this is a memorial to uh, poem for my grandson who was murdered uh, over 20 years ago. Checking the set for Christopher. He is buried on Mount Tamalpais in Marin County in California. There was nothing to forgive, then murder, impossible to forget. Drove your express spirit beyond the backbeat of no time, the know-how now presence gone, remembering your cramped tears, homesick, ready for return, stone buddy, cool dude, bings, gopher topher and rasta grandpa together inhaled our drug of choice, voicing synced to stop the violence, snorkeling over poetry of coral heads. Life's quick if it's not. Where is it there you've gone to be scattered ashes on Tamalpayan Peak? High beamed grin turned to us from 21 years of photo lit token keepsake images portending immediate fatal finality that shot too unexpected to be so true. It's tough. Tough. This is a beat poem. This is a very beat poem. It's called Dead or Alive. Alan's dead, Carl's dead, Jack's dead, Bill's dead, Neil's dead, Tim's dead. I'm alive. You're alive. You and you and you alive, alive, oh. Here in P.I. Carl all in blues locked in with you, define your terms, he answers to hello. Drop books, Janae, Celine, smart from under each arm, blue. Shirt blue, pants blue, shoes suede blue, to stick out, handshake. And he masturbated into the paper mache Easter bunny, and they took away the male nurse in a not so straight jacket, who asked what it was the pool of cum on the lunch table under the bunny, and Carl told him what it was, that same nurse who we ping-ponged scores, winning when he was losing, losing when he was winning, convincing ourselves, Carl Allen and me, that the poor trash nurse was nuttier than we. Lily's dead, Oma's dead, Jane's dead, Anne's dead, we're alive, you and you, and you, alive, alive, oh, not six yet four years young, Lily's mother dies, leaves me for Jack of undiscovered medicalities, her my Oma grandmother playing Chopin and Bach for me, hooked on sandbox and swing, these things on zish, 
disappeared, we sailed the SS Washington to USA freedom, refugeedom, and an awful appendix bursting pain held by Uncle Norbert to the portal, viewed Statue of Liberty first English lessons in Marasenia Hospital out of Little Black Sambo, round and round with tigers turning into butter. Not exactly what I'd had with good German Strubbelpeter, uncut nails and hair, too much soup and mind, your manners, or will decapitate you or worse. Adam's dead, Jared's dead, Otto's dead, and Irma's dead. You're alive to alive, alive, alive O. And one more. I spent a lot of time in Jamaica and the Caribbean, uh, in many out of the 30 years. Definitely, this is from a long poem called Carabella Poems. Definitely like honeymoon saga, raga, we tick, take, suck, poke, love, to lose a little memory, took, take, the holy must throws away, ask for one more draw, whatever wave by form, mold that is to cast, sea surfaces, slight motion, made constant cry of sun and shine, fragments of light net or light scales, fish, could it have been Hashem had a thing about shells, that must have been a later coming. Talk, talk. Blue sky says clouds. White wisps say sky. Black clouds give rain. Quick or louder than toke take. Pepper rock. Some seed, however. Later is at least next, and at most never. When they say later, they mean they mean next year. Dick, toke. Take the digital, twofer, convert, analog, noisy, diverting, jiggling, fuzzing, the knee on, beam, rippling, sprit, off sign, light net, sand scan, grain on grain, is on or off, black or white man, sun figure on shadow ground, Hashem's geometry, tick time, tok time, real time in paradigm. Thank you. Can we get the volume up on the mic, please? How's that? How's that? Good? Awesome. So following me, we'll, well, funny enough, we will have Michael Souter, then Adrian, and then Ben Gunsberg. Uh, but real quick, I'm going to read one to you called The 88. It's about a kid whose mom wants him to play the violin, but he just likes the blues too much. So, you want to hit it? School's out means two things. One, summer's in, two, lessons on the strings. Mom's decree, post-equinox, days of terriers. Not a jam rock Stratocaster, more like Stradivarius for Walt to carry past the no good neighborhood kids like a tombstone or a kick me sign. At least it's not a goddamn clarinet, am I right? <laughs> Wrong. The kid draws a bow like fingernails along a chalkboard Bored out his wits, truth is he'd rather swallow rosin than practice the violin And watch other kids through his window hold invisible fiddles And play him with their middle fingers for kicks and giggles Besides, he hates the classics, he likes the blues, ragtime, the jazzers, the bad men The out of hell that came cold with hands to translate soul Baked and bold, take the pain and make it gold, stank face soul but yo, yo, mom wanna raise him proper So she got him propped up on Bach, Chopin, and Shostakovich Hoping he'll turn out a young magnum opus Lil Vivaldi with a bowl cut Show that Mrs. Smith down the street up What can her kid do? Kick a goal, what? Where's the class and style? 
So she hatches a plan to invite him over for dinner and have a recital. Meanwhile, in the basement, Walt's lifting the lid on an upright crate that bears dust on a black and white 88. And legend it belonged to his late great, left the fam to chase the famed granddad who could rip a Steinway with vision. Rumor has it he was hired to play at exorcisms. Yeah, yeah, he could show the devil up, but mom hates his fucking guts. Rolling stone, such and such. So when Walt struck the middle C, like a match to kerosene, like a mob to heresy, mom has flashbacks to therapy and declared that he never touched the piano again. Oh, she did it. She did. She did it. She did. She did it. She did. So, summer's in. Full swing. Dinner scheduled two weeks. Practice schedule at its peak. How many hours a day? Three. Three? To iron out the sinks and hide the growing irony between son and mom and dearly deceased. But there ain't no shades of gray between the black and white keys. Matter of fact, there ain't no way the fates in the back of its schemes. So every second, mom's out the house while at the hound's mouth plunking out the sounds of angels who learn to get down when they hit the ground. Knows he shouldn't, but boogie boogie, no good. He ever understood he could put the put up in the pudding so for the yummy. Looky looky, what the crooked rookie playing hooky is cooking up. Woo! It's madness, beautiful, bad shit, crazy, bad is bad, can bad kiss. That is, until he hears the minivan pulling in and has to wrap his hands back around the violin. So his mom waltzes in a smile and thinking, my mind. Then she's dialing the whole neighborhood and telling them to save the dinner date for lots and lemonade and from her little chair of silken strings. Oh, she did it. She did. She did it. She did. She did it. She did. Oh, she did it. She did. She did it. She did. So. So, the covert soap burner stays incognito to avoid a scene akin to Tarantino till the day of the big concertino when he's standing between mom and the mirror getting his mop combed to the ears and it hits him like a shot of Everclear. He sucks at the violin worse than sorority chicks suck at drinking beer. But before he can warn mom of the impending fire, the first guests are beginning to arrive and she's whisked to the kitchen to show off her collection of fine china. Mama, his time is coming past, the die is cast. He might as well write a will to give his Legos to charity and his violin to the trash. Or perhaps he spiked the punch with anthrax and leave the country with snacks in his backpack. Wait, that's whack, no good. Soon the whole house is holding the whole hood. Oh, could things get any worse? Oh, yes, cutie pigtail down the street is standing next to the Smith kid in cleats. Somebody called the hearse. Then everybody's gathered in the backyard like a murderer of crows ready to laugh hard. And mom's stoking the flames when a filament starts glowing like hope in his brain. She says, Wally. Grab the violin and tell the guests to get ready for why they came. So he ducks inside, skips the music room, and heads to the basement. Blows the dust off the sides of his fade and wheels the piano onto the patio stage. When his mom sees the keys, she nearly faints. She feels an aneurysm forming in her brain, but he starts to play. He starts to play in the jaws of all. Oh my goodness, y'all, it's like the second coming of Ray Charles. gets down, everybody gets the sound, it ain't language, it's deeper, it's beat, it's the beat to keep, it's the beat of the heart, it's being beat and down, and even his mom can see it, and even she starts to cut a rug, burn a foot, rattle her skeleton, shake the dust, all night long everybody shakes the dust, I said all night long we all shake the dust, oh he did it, he did, he did it, he did it. Let's hear it for our next three readers, Michael, Adrian, and then Ben. Thank you guys for coming out. This is super awesome. So, uh, you know, they say you should never follow animals, children, or Nate Hardy. But <laughs> here I am, so. <laughs> that was awesome. So anyway, uh, I just wrote this poem for tonight. So it may be a little rough. But uh, I think I'm playing mostly with uh, saxophonists, yeah? What's your name? Morgan. Morgan. I'm playing mostly with Morgan. We have not prepared, so we're just going to go with it. <laughs> okay, so uh, I wrote this for tonight, I guess, because the season is changing. This poem is called Welcome in My Bed. With apologies to Shakespeare, Wordsworth, Wendell Berry, Elizabeth Bishop, Walt Whitman, Theodore Redke, and Sylvia Plath. 
mostly for the first stanza. When in disgrace, with fortune in men's eyes, when I all alone beweep my outcast state, when the world is too much with me, late and soon, and the art of losing is just too hard to master, when despair for the world grows in me, and I become tired and sick, too much acquainted with the night, I go to bed and shut my eyes, and the world drops dead. There are no scholars in my bed, no Foucauldians, Derridians, no Marx or Calvin or Hobbes, Freud or Jung, Spivak or Zizek, no one to critique my books, my looks, my likes, my locks, or my lack thereof. No one there says I messed up the angle or tangled the line, gave too much slack or not enough, left a dish in the sink or the seat up, cut the board wrong or pissed off the dean. The pillow takes the shape of my head every time and the comforter pulls right up to my chin. Three cats curl beside me and purr or pounce when my feet rub together by kindling. I can get into bed with Sappho or Sophie or Sylvia Plath, Virgil or Homer or Ted Hughes, Mirabai, Rumi or Kabir. I can hum Moon River or Over the Rainbow or it's the end of the world and feel fine reminiscing about teenage love and lysergic acid or lie in corpse pose declining Sanskrit nouns. That's for you, Mark. <laughs> Sleep descends like a crow to carry me off in the down of her great black wing. I'm welcome in my bed in my underwear or naked in a beanie, in my saffron-covered hoodie. And when my wife opens a window, the hoodie covers my head, and I listen to the rain and wind thrash the ash tree above us, hear thunder chase the lightning down the street. Once in Dharmshala, high in the Himalayas, the windows of our stone cottage rattle as lightning and thunder exploded all at once, like a cannon's flash and bang. You can fool around in bed with your partner, or alone, in Dharamshala, Amantea, Lima, Ascension, in your room in the Ritz-Carlton, the red carpet, a pension, listening to Charlie Bird's saxophone and sleep afterwards or before. It's really all just fine. Whether I have sinned, been mean or unkind, or given all my money to the poor, I'm welcome just the same. The stars shine on the wicked the same as the just. On the sidewalks of Calcutta, in the sidewalks of Mumbai, families lie down under blankets by cook pots and dishes, welcomed by the cooling night. A boy wraps a light cloth around him. On banyan branches, crows shake their feathers in dreams. And tonight, somewhere under an overpass, a runaway snuggles in her father's sleeping bag. A woman lies in the back of her car, a baby under one arm, and a boy wheeled into surgery, and a grandfather in recovery, the farmer who lost his farm, and the trader who made her fortune, protesters, politicians, Obama and Trump, Putin and Pope Francis, horses in the field and mule deer in the mountains, beaver and bobcat, hawk and thrush, Tonight, close their eyes just the same. Stars awaken and the moon boat floats by, lighting the limestone cliffs. My father one night lay down in his bed and never got up. 
Years later, my mother did the same. I'm in perfect health, she exclaimed. I've never felt better in my life. Then she was dead. Now he lies in North Carolina under walnut trees. She sleeps in an urn like a genie on my sister's mantelpiece. The Vedas say, in dreamless sleep, we enter the enlightened state, a place that is not a place where the candle of the separate self goes out, a brilliance like a thousand suns too bright for eyes to see. So we remember it as darkness, if we remember at all. Still, we wake up refreshed every day. When I'm retired and my friends are gone and my bores have moved away, the ones I used to sing to sleep, I'll make a fire in the cabin stove and put in extra logs. And my love and I will sit up late and read then we'll climb the stairs, open a window, and snuggle in our bed where she often rubs my hand until the sound of the river and the moonlight and the hermit thrush carry us off to sleep. Thank you, guys. It's, a, it's an amazing thing to be up here, so I guess. Uh, you know, we were in a race just then. Um, so, uh, hello everyone, I'm, my name is Adrian Thompson, and uh, I cannot say how amazing it is to have an event like this with so many people uh, here, um, uh, partly to acknowledge, at least I'm going to, uh, our uh, beat collection here at the University Library, uh, because uh, I've been working there, or I was working there uh, for a long time, for maybe for four, probably four and a half years um, at the, at the, uh, uh, the university library uh, where we have the beat collection uh, and thank you so much in uh, what, is, what is called the art book room is what it is. Um, and working there, uh, I, especially, I especially came to enjoy uh, uh, the poetry of Gary Snyder uh, and especially in the ways how he uses uh, Eastern minimalism uh, as a tool to convey uh, his loves of uh, the natural world that exists here in the West and exists in his day. Uh, well, he's still alive. His day is continuous uh, at the moment. And um, also the mythicality that, that lies behind it. Uh, so uh, I wrote a couple poems for tonight. Uh, uh, one, one takes place uh, in my hometown of Randolph, which is sort of uh, that way, just before you get to Wyoming, out in the out in the boonies, and uh, that uh, that the that poem occurred on um, September twenty twenty eighth, I think, this year, and the other one uh, was me coming back here and taking a walk. Uh, on October 27th, so that was strange. Uh, but uh, one of them, the first one's pretty short, so I'll just lead, uh, lead into both of them. Um, good. Thank you all. Thank you guys for coming today. So, uh, the first one's called The Yard Morning After Ten Minutes Hail. No berries in the hills this year, says Dad. Up six bit, looking for bear. Berries in the yard, yellow currants, frozen globes of honey, elderberries, clumps of fog, blue dusk, cherry red crab apples. We throw over the fence for deer. Garnet spit seed hawthorn. Mom says the puppy eats. They get her high, make her see snakes in the grass. Late September, ten minutes of hail. Water clinging to bushes, cold moisture air, white clumps like snow among the fallen yellow leaves. And I told 
totally forgot to mention that I'll be um, speaking in how I read here Gary Snyder as I read his work. <laughs> I should have mentioned that earlier. Anyway, I'm also dressed like him anyway, <laughs> as Kerouac described himself. Uh, yeah, this one's walking to river in new snow morning. Down the hill from the university to go fishing on Sunday. Fishing pole slung over shoulder, brown coveralls and coat, lumberjack checked, not logger plaid, with a beaver hat grandpa wore in the 40s. Kick stones down dirt switchbacks, round ones roll, tumble through powder, kick up constant halos, make trails of their own. Bell curved skyline, soft white against blue, above me. Descend down bare path between fall yellow mahalo and wild red rose hip. Prancing along, singing camp town races like Foghorn Leghorn does on his own, walks to go fishing, charm the widow, or get the best of that old dog. I picture these moments as epitomal joy. Passing bush claims my marvelous gold Jake. Didn't even feel the tug, only saw the broke line droop to my feet. Down wooden, stow laden steps, Kyoto temple, rebar stakes in place to trail. Path between trees, snowflakes fall as leaves. Roost family of quails, flight from tree, skitter slope, down dive bomb upwards across path. Whiffle ball, hummingbird, hummingbird trill. The fat male bobs, tiny top knot, as females in dense branches, deer beds. Trail opens to ending. Supple magpie lands in tree above. Bright wide eye, a bit of the sky behind it. Canada geese, bugle in clear air. Count quick in twos, pin pair. Fly in pantographic V, round bend in road, hear hidden rush of river, arrive. Cast line in water, too light, can't get past the weeds. Ducks everywhere, tucked up in bank, in coal, dull of gray bread loaves, sitting in rows. Two circle each other, in the water. Female clicks like a new duckling, male keeps nodding, shine emerald head water dips. They mate over in a second, does not end in death as it sometimes does. They both wash up and all the rest start quacking raucously in congratulations. Then they move, some thirty at once, up on the bank. Two white and black, trim breast duxedo, lead the pack, engage the exodus. I choose a spot and switch. Watch dip or dip. Opposite bank, kingfisher sits. No fish. From tree above, clumps of snow fall into water, disappear. Thank you all. This poem is called What a Baby. What a baby. What a baby, what a fat, fat baby, fat, baby fat, in fat, in fat, in fact, in fact, facts, vax, vaccinations for baby, baby fat, in fact, baby, in fact, vaccination, vaccination, vacation, vacation, Haitian, vacation. In fact, in fact, in fat nation, vacation, vacation, great nation, Asian, great nation, great Asian, fast, hasten, fast, hasten, fast, fast, fat, wait, 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 fat, wait, fat, way, way. Way fat baby, way fat, way baby, wait, Amy, 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 
Amy, aim, aim, shoot, don't, don't, aim, shoot, 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 who, ooh, 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 fat, too fat, too fat, too, ooh, ooh, fat, ooh, who, fat, who, who's fat, who's fat, who's, who's, woozy, woozy, who's woozy, woozy, Susie, Susie, you, who, you, woozy, Susie, who's baby, who's fat, fat, baby, fat, maybe, my baby, what, baby, my baby, what, what, my baby, my baby, what, baby, my baby, what, 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 I'd like to see the one who invented poetry, who invented writing, who scratched lines in clay, sprayed ink on paper until it melted into meaning, gave us something to believe in. I'd like to see the one who invented emotion, who found something to put hope in, who delved deeper than the ocean into the hearts of the human to plant fear, depression, anxiety, Love, hate, misery, joy, all the messy pieces sticky like glue. I'd like to see the one who invented the universe, who created us, who sparked life into stars and moons beyond, and birthed such insignificant life to suffer, to wonder, to simply exist, to sit in the midst of our minuscule planet. I'd like to see the one who invented racism, divided brothers and sisters, who stole the rights and freedoms of others so the rich could keep getting richer, rolling and laughing in golden graves, white colonists thinking they aren't wrong in this, and ignorant people who still separate today. I'd like to see the one who invented global warming, who deny the pollution storming, the Earth's funeral they are forming, but no flowers will sit on the planet's tomb. It's sculpted from plastic and poison unborn children with eyes like smog. I'd like to see, no, I'd like to be the one to invent something good, someone, anyone, anything. Hi, I'm Jordan Forrest actually known as Jofo, and um, that's just my rapper name in case writing doesn't work out. Well, I mean, rap is writing. Okay, you know what? All right, it's good, it's good, it's good. Um, so, today I'm going to read a little poem um, I wrote. So I worked for a little while at a dry cleaner, and um, bad experience, great writing research. So there's a lot of writing that can come out of that. So this is a poem I call Stain. Why do you toss me your shirt buttoned up inside out like you had just peeled it over your head? That shirt and that cheap cologne, the wrapper in your pocket, a wad of gum you nod on all tongue and cheek. I undo every button, the two at the collar, the two on each sleeve, eight from belly to Adam's apple. But smeared inside your collar, brown gives you away. I think of you dying, what's left of your hair. Your back twisted in the mirror as you reach for parts of yourself only others can see. Um, hi there, my name is Lauren. Um, it is an honor to be here uh, with so many talented poets. My poem is called Through the Telescope. I see galaxies bob like cereal or soup. Planets, blue colored pebbles, Mother Everything scoops with her spoon. I imagine we taste fruity, crackle pop, crunch, sugar coated rings stuck between her teeth. In the bottom of the bowl, turquoise tinted plumes coil in bloom, swirl. 
pearl and swoon. She watches our dust-sized eyes wide through Hubble's glassy moat, our mouths insignificant toes like Cheerios. We label each part of her body for science, map her dimples, call them stars, her red nipples we label Mars, her eyes inky space we stare and wonder if any man could survive out there. But when she lifts the saucer to her lips, nebulas dribble down her neck, she swallows and specks of our existence wash away with a swig from the Milky Way. I dream to be as big as her, stars woven through my hair, her curves, my curves, her colors, billows of blue, petals of yellows, demanding to be big, big, her words, our words, cracking licks of flame. No one speaks over her, our breath filled with all we have shouldered, sucks you into silence. Don't fathom her expanse, there's no way to define the woman in the sky, but mankind hacks her body, labels her breasts and legs and lips, and lips open space, prepare ships and vessels for exploration. This is how I know the universe is a woman. I hope she whisks eggs for no one but herself, hums sunny side of the street, twilight fingers, sprinkle chives and dark dust, into a pan where man sizzles and stares back, catching glimpses of her freckles and spices, smudging her wrists. Pointing to her crescent fingernail, dipping into the bowl of batter, mankind cries moo, stabbing their teeny phallic flags into the soft beds of her skin, spinning stars with her breath in an exhale. She smiles and licks her fingers clean. Cold. February 1st, zero degrees at 6 a.m. In this old house, cold moves in when the heater shuts off. Gusts along tall wooden baseboards blows across the floor, climbs up the walls. I wear two pairs of socks, wool, and polar fleece. I layer sweaters over sweatshirts, sweatpants over leggings. I do all my work in fingerless gloves. When it gets this cold, I go in the bathroom, close the door, turn on the portable heater, and listen to the news on the radio. February 2nd, 3 below zero, 7 a.m. This morning, the news is on the California House. Republicans are having their way on everything. Democrats have been holding in check. The radical right wing is moving, passing measures they've been sitting on for 15 years. They're weakening environmental laws, banning same-sex marriages, allowing spanking in schools, cutting welfare. Republicans claim the pendulum has been swinging too far to the liberal. February 3rd, still below zero at 8 a.m. When I get so cold I can't warm up, I take my clothes off and fill the bathtub with hot water, lie down and soak up the heat until I'm my own radiator. I think of summer in southern Utah, red heat shimmering off sandstone cliffs, the lizards we kept in the trailer, the way we lived together then. I worked in the health care center. She tended far. We wanted the desert on our days off until she had to quit. I remember how I held her for hours in the heat the day before she died. The fever so bad she thought she was freezing. February 4th, zero again. 7 a.m. My dog and my cat trade places on the heat vent. The dog crowds it while the furnace runs, his ears flapping with force in the air. The cat takes 
over when it's off, snuggling down in a full body crouch as Siamese vent cover. On the radio, the Republicans are sniping at the president again. If we could get welfare reformed, we could surely balance the budget. I think of my ex-husband, the way he doled out allowance for me to balance our budget. Those days, women worked at less than minimum wage. There were ways around it. Men paid the bills. Women bought the little extras. In my case, the groceries, the allowance, wouldn't cover the socks and underwear, school supplies for the kids. In those days, we thought women married men had their children, stayed married until they died. 25 years, no job skills, and one black eye too many. I left anyway, now that he couldn't threaten to keep my kids. Now I stand on the heat vent with the dog, wondering when they'll turn off the gas. I think of southern Utah, the way I went there, because it was warm, because I can pay my way. I think of how I came back, of how I asked for public assistance, and I couldn't get it of how I live now. And on the radio, the new Christian right promises to take us back to our old values where our men will take care of their women again. The Republicans promise to take us on welfare to give the country back to the honest, Outside the cold lifts, the fog settles. I take my medication and get back to work. At noon, I break for tea, read a review about the writer, Sony Rabu Tansy, how he says, Africa is the only continent left that has not found its way. How he found remission from AIDS by way of African traditional healing and Christian evangelism. How he said before he died to be a poet, into the silence of history. And I am reminded of Adrian Rich, who says we cannot wait to speak until we are perfectly clear and righteous. And I am reminded of how writers must be political. And I remember now how I found my way, how I studied and worked and learned to leave, how I said I'd die before I let him hurt me again, how I could stand anything now that my children were grown and gone. But on the radio, I hear them threatening my children, arguing over what to do with me, talking about my dead lover and our right to have existed together. And it's cold. Hi everyone, thanks for staying to the last. Um, thank you Nate, this is a wonderful event. Um, I'm just really happy to be a part of it. Um, I'm Shannon Ballum, I'm going to read a poem that's called Reasons, it's a villanelle. Reasons. You who just to feel your falling fell, unlocked your eyes to splendid shame. You who craved delicious hell fell to feel the spark in every cell, shock of knowing shimmers your brain. You who just to feel your falling fell into silence, aching tongue of bell, hungry to be rung to sound your name. You 
you who crave delicious hell yearn for serpents, toxic tonics they sell, their promise to feed, to satiate pain. You who just to feel your falling fell into love, its incinerating spell, its sad hiss of ashes after the flame. You, you crave delicious hell, the thrill of bitter bliss propels you to part your lips, taste, relish, blame. You who crave delicious hell, you who just to feel your falling. 